Hi, good morning and welcome to the next video in the cybersecurity space. In this, we are going to discuss ethical hacking and penetration testing. So we are going to talk about the concepts about what constitutes an ethical hack and what is a penetration test. We are going to talk about the different types of penetration tests and how they can be done. We are going to talk about an operating system called Kali Linux and we are going to talk about its usage and its importance in cybersecurity. We will also be discussing the different phases of penetration test and how people or hackers would utilize these phases uh, to gain their objectives. We will also be discussing in what areas can we do a penetration test, how to do those penetration tests. We will be discussing a, quite a few bit of penetration testing tools that are available in the Kali Linux space and then we'll be looking at a couple of demos at the end of the session to understand how these tools in the operating system can be utilized for various hacks. So let's start with, with what is ethical hacking. Now plainly defined ethical hacking is locating weaknesses or vulnerabilities of computers and information systems using the intent and actions of a malicious hacker. The major difference is here that we are hired to discover those weaknesses in a legal and ethical manner. That means, first and foremost, our intent should not be malicious. We do not wish any harm to the organization and whatever we discover is reported back and not misused. Once we report back, we would also be trying to help them out to mitigate or remove those weaknesses or vulnerabilities to enhance the com uh, company's security posture. So essentially, we would have the same training or the same knowledge as that of a malicious hacker except that the intent is going to be different. The intent is going to help the organization achieve security to protect themselves against malicious hackers. And the second most important thing about ethical hacking is that we are authorized to do that activity. I cannot in good faith hack somebody and then tell them, you know what, I just, I just wanted to help you out and uh, here are your vulnerabilities and uh, this is the way you can prevent them. I first need the authorization from the other party and only then can I perform an ethical hack. So, in this example, hacker attacks an individual with malicious intent and makes misuse of whatever information they have gotten. They steal the data, they maybe fry the operating system, to hardware, destroy it, and thus uh, they leave the victim without uh, a device. With authorization, an ethical hacker can also attack the same individual, minus the destruction, of course, and the intent is good, so they are willingly finding out the vulnerabilities and helping the victim plug them out so that they wouldn't be a victim of a malicious attack. Now here, the first thing is authorization from the victim. And the second thing is the good intent, where we do not misuse those vulnerabilities and we report them back to the victim or to the client and help them uh, patch those vulnerabilities. That's the main difference between a white hat and a black hat. So security experts are normally termed as white hat hackers, malicious hackers are termed as black hats. Now the responsibilities of an ethical hacker are multifold. First and foremost you have to create scripts, test for vulnerabilities, first have to identify those in the first place. So there's a vulnerability assessment identifying those vulnerabilities and then you're going to test them to see the validity and the complexity of those vulnerabilities. So your one of your responsibilities would be to develop tools to increase security as well or to configure security in such a way that it would be difficult to breach. Performing risk assessment. Now what is a risk? Risk is a threat that is posed to an organization by a possibility of getting hacked. So let's say I as an ethical hacker run a vulnerability scanner on a particular client. I identify 10 different vulnerabilities. Within those 10 vulnerabilities, I do a risk assessment to identify which vulnerability is critical, would have the most impact on the client, and what would be the repercussions if those vulnerabilities actually get exploited. So I'm trying to find out in risk assessment that if the client gets hacked with the vulnerabilities identified, what is the loss they would be facing? once they get hacked and the loss could not only be loss of data it could be financial losses it could be loss of reputation penalties they have to pay to the client for breaches or penalties that they may have to pay for pay the governments in case of breaches that happened that uh, couldn't be controlled another responsibility of the ethical hacker is to set up policies in such a way that it becomes difficult for hackers to get access to devices or to protected data and finally train the staff for network security so uh, we've got a lot of employees in an organization we need to train the staff of what is allowed and what is not allowed how to keep themselves secure so that they don't get compromised thus becoming a vulnerability themselves to the organization the policies that we have talked about are administrative policies to govern the employees of the organization for example password policies 
Most of the organizations will have a tough password policy where they say you have to create a password that meets a certain level of complexity before that can be accepted. And till you create that password, you're not allowed to log in or you're not allowed to register. So let's move on to understand what is penetration testing. Now for penetration testing, there is a phase called vulnerability assessment that happens before this. Vulnerability assessment is nothing but running a scanning tool to identify a list of potential flaws or vulnerabilities within the organization. Once you have identified the list of those vulnerabilities, you would then move on to penetration test. This is the part of ethical hacking where it specifically focuses on penetration only uh, of the information systems. So you have identified that flaw. Maybe it could be a database with a SQL injection, or it could be uh, a buffer overrun, uh, overrun flaw, or it could be a simple password cracking attempt. Your idea is to create those tools, create those attacks, and try to penetrate into those areas where security is weak. Uh, the essence of penetration testing is to penetrate information systems using various attacks. The attacks could be anything like a phishing attack, a password cracking attack, a denial of service attack, or any other vulnerabilities that you have identified uh, during the vulnerability scan. So what is Kali Linux and why is it used? Kali Linux is an operating system often used by hackers and ethical hackers both because of the tool sets that the operating system contains. It is an operating system created by professionals with a lot of embedded tools. It is a Debian based operating system with advanced penetration testing and security auditing features. There are more than 600 plus odd tools on that operating system that can help you leverage any of the attacks, man in the middle attacks, sniffing, password cracking, uh, any of these attacks would be possible with all the tools available. You just need to know how to utilize the operating system and its tools. It contains, like I said, a hundred of hundreds of tools uh, that are used for various information security tasks like uh, computer forensics, reverse, reverse engineering, information finding, even uh, getting access to different machines and then uh, creating viruses, worms, trojans, anything that you will. 600 plus tools in the Kali Linux operating system. There are periodic updates that are given out to the operating system as well. It is open source. That means it is free to utilize. You can even have the source code. You can modify it if you want to. There's customizations available for all the tools. You can download third party tools and install them if you want. There's a wide support for wireless uh, network cards. Multiple languages are being supported at the, th at the same time as well. And you can create a lot of attacking uh, scripts, you can create attacking tools and you can write your own exploits as well on Kali Linux. So this all, uh, all in all helps you create a very robust system where you can create your own attacks and then launch them against unsuspecting victims. Now that is illegal. So as far as ethical hacking is concerned, once you have authorization, you're going to identify which tools to be utilized, you're going to get the appropriate permissions and only then are you going to attempt those attacks. Let's talk about the phases of penetration testing. Now, there are five different phases. The first one is the reconnaissance phase, also known as the information gathering phase. This is the most important phase for any hacker. This is where the hacker or the ethical hacker, if you will, will gather as much information about the target's victim or vice versa, the, vic the victim, right? So once you have that information, you would then be able to identify what tool sets to include and how to attack the victim. For example, you want to find out the IP addresses, the domains, subdomains, the network architecture that is being utilized. You want to identify operating systems that are being utilized, the network IP ranges that are being utilized, and so on and so forth. You might want to identify employees within an organization for social engineering attacks in the future, email addresses, telephone numbers, anything and everything that will help you validate and give you information about the target is something that you want to do in the reconnaissance phase. At this point in time, we are not going to question whether whatever information we are getting is useful or not. Only time will tell depending on the various attacks that we will be building up later on. This becomes your baseline. This becomes your database with all the information about the victim so that you can come back from later stages back to the reconnaissance phase to look at the information that you have gathered and then you can fine tune your attacks. Once you have done that, you're going to uh, then start the scanning phase. Based on the information that you have gathered, you're going to identify live machines within a network. Once you've identified the live machines, you'll scan them for open ports, protocols and procedures, any processes that are running. And then we were going to identify vulnerabilities within these processes and within these open ports. So in the scanning phase, uh, 
why do we need to find live machines because we want to find out the machines that have booted up have an operating system and are running on the network if an op machine is not available on the network or is in a shutdown mode that machine cannot be hacked through a technical attack then it would be a physical attack where you physically go to the machine and then do whatever you want to do with it for a technical attack you will have to identify the machines that have booted up then you're going to scan the open ports because that's going to be our entry point and on the port would be a service that is running so you scan the service as well identify the version of the service and then do a vulnerability scan to identify if there are any vulnerabilities on those services that are running and then based on all of this information we are going to develop our attacks as we go on so once we have this we go on to the gaining access phase where we are going to attack and try to get access to our victims machines could be a social engineering attack based on the information gathering we have done in the technical assessment and scanning phase if we have identified a vulnerability we are going to identify a relevant exploit and then use that exploit to try to gain access or we might just craft a trojan and try to uh, execute that trojan on the victims machine to uh, check if we can get access through that particular manner once we have the access could be even a, a simple password cracking attack which we have been able to accomplish and we have cracked the password of the person and now we have gained access to that person's computer right but these attacks would be temporary for example we have cracked a password somebody changes the password every 30 days after that period our attack would be useless if a trojan is executed we get a connection to that machine for once but then how do we get, uh, get a repeated connection over and over again if we want to reconnect to that machine so that's where we come into the maintaining access phase where we install uh, root kits key loggers sniffers and things like that where we could get a backdoor entry to the victim's machine if we have already been successfully installed a trojan we would want to add the trojan to the startup menu so that every time the operating system starts the trojan gets automatically executed and thus we maintain the backdoor entry to that victim's machine once we have done all of this all these activities are going to leave a trace in the victim's machine so if we install a trojan a trojan being an application would create directories and files a virus would be destructive in nature if you are executing a script it will leave some logs behind if we even log in through the cracked password that we have it will create a login entry at for that particular timestamp along with the ip address that we utilized in the covering tracks we are essentially trying to avoid detection by deleting traces of our activity that means that we need to identify where logs have been stored we need to address those logs and we need to delete them or modify them in such a way that our activity is not traceable so these are the five main phases of a penetration test gather as much information as you can scan for machines ports protocols and services running on the victim's device try to gain access by password cracking trojans exploits for the vulnerabilities if any maintain that access by installing further software which will allow you to get backdoor access to that particular system and then try to cover your tracks by deleting all traces of your activity once successful the victim will have no idea and you have a backdoor entry and you can monitor the victim to the extent that you want now in an ethical hacker's perspective this penetration test can be done in multiple aspects so uh, again understand the fact that we are doing an authorized activity we have identified the tools that we have to use identified the attacks we have got the appropriate authorization and based on that authorization we are conducting a penetration test the penetration test may be asked to be done in one of these manners first is the black box test the black box test is where no information is given to the ethical hacker about the it infrastructure so they have no idea what it is they start right from the first phase of the information gathering gather as much information as they can and based on the gathered information they try to create and launch a attacks to see if they are going to be successful now not only does it test the knowledge of the penetration tester it would also test the security implementations that the organization has done to see whether they can identify the attack and prevent it in the first place so this is the simulation of a malicious hacker scenario where a malicious hacker having no idea about the organization first tries to gather information and then tries to attack that organization so no source code knowledge no technological knowledge nothing they're just going to try to gather information scan those devices and then try to gain access the second test is a gray box test where some information is given or some knowledge of the it infrastructure is given think of it from a employee's perspective a regular employee in an organization who doesn't have extra privileges uh, like an administrator 
but is just a, a regular employee does that means that they got limited access within the organization based on which they get some knowledge of the IT infrastructure. So this is an attempt of an insider uh, simulation attack where a regular user may want to try to misuse the access that they've been given and then try to gather information or try to gain access to other devices which they are not authorized to. The third test is white box where there's full knowledge of the IT infrastructure that has been given. So this is again a simulation of an insider attack, a malicious insider if you will. But at this point in time, the person has complete knowledge of the in infrastructure, could be in an administrative position, and then they are trying to leverage their access to see if they can get information or they can compromise any stuff, any of the data. So the three attacks would be the first one, black box, where we are simulating uh, external threat, a hacker sitting outside the organization trying to gain access. The gray box is an insider threat where there is a regular employee who is trying to get access to infrastructure that they are not authorized for. And then the third audit is a white box audit where there is an administrator who has all the leverage, all the access and the visibility within the inf uh, in infrastructure. And then they are trying to misuse their access to see what else they can get from whatever access has been authorized to them. Now let's look at the areas of penetration testing. Where all could we do a penetration test, thus compromising the security of the application or of the server or of the user. So first and foremost, network services. It finds vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the security of the network infrastructure. So for example, we have switches, routers, firewalls in a network. All of these are devices that need a configuration. If they have been not correctly configured or if they have not been correctly secured, they would leave some vulnerabilities behind. If we as ethical hackers are able to identify these flaws, these misconfigurations, these vulnerabilities, we could then try to exploit them and try to gain access to the network and devices within that network by uh, getting access to the network in the first place. Then we have the web applications. Web applications are nothing but softwares that are developed over or deployed over a web server and are made available over the intranet or the internet. For example, uh, websites that we visit or uh, web applications like uh, Facebook, if you will, right? So if these applications have vulnerabilities within them, we then try to attack the web-based applications and thus try to bypass authentication or get access to database or try to leak information through those applications. If not, then we try to attack the client side. Now, web application is at the server level and is hosted by the deployer. So that's at the server side. The client side is where we as users are using a computer with a browser and trying to interact with the web application. Now, the browser and the operating system that we are utilizing would have its own vulnerabilities. Thus, identifying a client side vulnerability and then exploiting it to either, either hack the client or then piggyback on the client's connection and try to get access to the server. So either you could attack the network, the web application or the client side itself, or you could attack wireless networks. This test would examine all the wireless devices which are used in a corporation. Most of the wireless would have laptops, smartphones, tablets, phablets, all of those connected to them. If you are able to access any of these devices through the wireless, it would help you gain access to other devices on the wireless as well. And then social engineering. So this is where you're trying to attack humans. You're tracking an employee of a corporation to reveal some confidential information knowingly or unknowingly by tricking them with uh, fake mails or fake websites or ma malicious emails that you have sent to them, uh, which they have failed to recognize as malicious and they click on it, thus getting victimized. Social engineering attacks are always uh, successful because of the gullibility of humans. Empathy, sympathy, humans basically have emotions. Emotions can be toyed with and then taken advantage of if the person is not careful enough. For example, the most common social engineering attack that we see is the Nigerian fraud where we receive an email that someone somewhere has died and has left a huge estate behind a few hundred million dollars and we have been identified as the person through whom they want to transfer the money to a foreign land to save on taxes. What are the chances of that happening on a daily basis, right? How many princes are there? So that's something that we do not verify. It's just the, I guess, the greed, if you will, of striking it rich quickly that makes us believe these kind of emails. Uh, we have also received emails of lottery tickets that we have won over a period of time without even having bought a lottery ticket. So if you haven't bought one, what did you win? But we don't ask these questions. We just get excited about the amount of money that we have won and then we try to bet on our luck and try to see if that uh, email is going to fructify or is it just another scam. So social engineering attacks are dime a dozen these days and we need to be very careful on what we trust on the internet.
Let's look at the penetration testing tools. There are hundreds and thousands of tools out there. Most of these have been concised and collected together and hosted on a operating system known as Kali Linux that we have talked about earlier. Now the predecessor to Kali Linux was Backtrack. Backtrack is no longer continued, it has been discontinued and Kali Linux has taken uh, the place of Backtrack, within which are all the tools that you see on your screen. Metasploit is one of the most favorite penetration testing tools of hackers and ethical hackers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, inbuilt exploits over there and we'll be doing a demo at the end of the session on this. Nmap is the information gathering tool which will scan for live devices, scan for open ports, protocols and services. Beef would be an application testing tool that would help us uh, find exploits within applications. Nessus vulnerability scanner is a network and a host based scanner that would help you identify vulnerabilities within such hosts. Wireshark is a network sniffer which allows you to capture network packets and, and analyze them to see if there are any, there is any information worth capturing within those packets. SQL map is a automated tool used for SQL injection attacks. So you don't even have to craft your queries for SQL injection. It will be done by the SQL map tool. You just need to identify whatever is possible through the queries that the SQL is going to create. And then based on the activity that you've identified, you just need to redefine your search parameters to get access to the database. We will be doing a demo on SQL map or SQL map as well. And then there is John the Ripper. John the Ripper is a tool that is used for password cracking. So dictionary attacks, brute force attacks are done using John the Ripper. What is a dictionary attack? A dictionary attack is an attack where we create list of all probable passwords, store them in a TXT file and run that list against the password tool to see if any of those passwords are going to match. A brute force attack is trying the same attack but with every permutation and combination of the alphabet that we have and we are going to try to figure out uh, if we are able to crack the password at all. So these are just some of the tools. For every tool, there are another supporting 100 tools or more than that. Uh, like for Nessus vulnerability scanner, you'll have Collis vulnerability scanner. You have uh, GFI LandGuard and there are other, uh, lots of other softwares out there. But these are some of the most commonly utilized tools. Let's look at the Metasploit attack. Metasploit is a framework of uh, penetration testing that uh, makes hacking very simple. You just need to know how to utilize the tool. You need to identify the vulnerability associated with a particular exploit and then run the exploit on Metasploit. Uh, we'll be demoing this during the practical. So there are active exploits and passive exploits. In active exploits, it exploits a specific computer, runs until execution and then exits, uses brute force and exits when an error occurs. In a passive exploit, these exploits wait for incoming requests and exploit them as soon as they connect. They can also be used in conjunction with emails and web browsers. So in passive exploits, we create a payload, we uh, like a reverse connection payload, we send it to the victim. Once a victim installs that software, the machine will then initiate a connection to us. Our machine will be in a listen mode and then we will once the software is executed at their end, we would then try to connect and exploit that particular vulnerability. This is the uh, practical that we'll be doing on Metasploit. So let's move on with the demos and then we'll see uh, what we can discuss amongst them. All right, let's have a look at some of the demos that we had uh, talked about in the ethical hacking and penetration testing module. We are going to look at three different demos. The first one is going to be a SQL injection attack that we are going to perform on this tool that we have. The second one is a password cracking attack on Windows 7. And a third one is a meter breeder based or a Metasploit based shellshock attack on a Linux based web server. So let's get cracking. I've powered on this virtual machine, uh, which is the OVASP broken web application. It is a tool that is provided for uh, people who want to enhance their skills and they can practice uh, how to do these attacks in a legal manner. So we are going to go to this site. I'm just going to open up my browser. The IP address is 71.132 and that's the uh, OVASP broken web application that we want to utilize. We are going to head off to Mutili Day 2 and we are going to look at a SQL injection attack where we want to bypass authentication. Now this takes us to the login screen. So we can just try our luck here and see that the authentication mechanism works. The account does not exist. So the username and password that we have supplied is not the correct one. So 
we want to ensure that there's a SQL database and uh, we can uh, try to attack it and see uh, if we can bypass the authentication. Now, uh, what we want to do is we want to create a SQL based malform query that can give us a different output. So I'm just going to type in a single quote over here and type login and you can see that this is now suddenly recognized as a operator and there's an error that is given out compared to the login that we tried uh, earlier when we used a proper text based login mechanism it gave us the account does not exist but here the single quote gave us a error and it shows us how sql works this is the query that we had created now in the trainings that you have for ethical hacking there would be explanations of what these queries are all about how this syntax works here we're just going to see if we can create a malform query to log in as a user in this case so what i'm going to do is uh, create the query over here and we're going to give it a comparison so we're going to give it a or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space and if you now click login you should be able to bypass authentication and you can see user has been authenticated and we now have admin access to this application now here the sql queries need to be crafted in such a perspective that they're going to work so there would be a lot of exercise in identifying what the database is there's a microsoft database and oracle database and so on and so forth and then you have to choose those proper commands but identifying that would come in the training right now we're just looking at them at a demo this is how a sql injection attack works now let me log out here similarly now we are in a login page the same query work wonders where it allowed us to bypass authentication so it also depends on what kind of a page i am and what query would be accepted at this point in time so here application understanding would also come into the picture where uh, which function we are calling upon when we are connected to a particular page now this is a user lookup function right so again here we try the same method test test that's not going to work authentication error bad user or password and if we type in the same query over here single quote or and give it a condition single quote or one equals one hy space hyphen hyphen space now here it is not going to log us in because this is not a login page this is a user lookup form so here it will instead give us a dump of all the databases that it has so you can see all the usernames and passwords coming in that are stored in the user lookup field so this is where the uh, understanding comes in of which query to create at what page we are depending upon the function that has been called right so that's the sql uh, injection attack that we wanted to look at let's move on to password cracking now this is a windows 7 machine that we have i'm just going to do a very basic password cracking example we're just going to log in now here the assumption is that we are able to log in we have access to a computer and we want to check out other users who are using this computer and see if we can find out their passwords so that uh, we can log in as a different user steal data if required and we wouldn't be to blame if there are any logs that are created so here we've got a tool called cane enable that is installed right here now i'm already an administrator on this machine i'm checking out other administrators who share the same privileges or any other user who may be on this system whose password i can crack and thus i would be able to get access through their account and then do any malicious activity right so this allows me to go into a cracker tool and it allows me to enumerate this machine and identify all the users and passwords that are there in this particular machine right so i'm just going to click on the plus sign and i'm going to import uh, hashes from a local system so where are these files stored where does windows store its passwords in what format are they stored and what this tool does to retrieve those that's something that we all need to know as an ethical hacker right so import the hashes from the local system click on next it's going to enumerate that file and it is going to give you a list of all the users that, that are there so you can see the users are hacker admin test the one that we are logged in as and then there's a user called virus as well and you can see that this is the hash value of the password that is being utilized now there's a particular format uh, for a hash value for windows and how it stores but once we have these hash values let's say if i want to crack this password there are various attacks that we can do for example a dictionary based attack or a brute force attack let's try a brute force attack right ntlm is the hashing mechanism that is used by windows so we are going to try to create an ntlm hash attack and here we are going to use a predetermined rule set for example we are not sure what characters are being utilized over here so we just create an attack like this using all characters and uh, lowercase a through z uppercase a through z numeric 0 through 9 and all the special characters let's say the password is between 7 and 16 characters 
and this is the character set that we want to try the brute force attack on. What is a brute force attack? It is an attack where the computer is going to try each and every permutation and combination out of this character set and try to figure out if the password is going to be correct. So if we click start, it's going to start with a particular characters and then it is going to identify if that NTLM hash is going to work against this character. And you can see the time is going to be phenomenal over here. So it's not necessary that this attack would be viable. It will be 100% successful given the time frame. However, the time frame is huge enough for this attack to become a little bit redundant. There are other attacks that we can do which can easily identify this data for us as well. But that is something that we will look on in future videos. So that's how we can get access to users and passwords. Uh, there are different mechanisms where let's say we don't have login access, then what are we going to do? How we can create a fake user, login, or how we can remotely access a machine and then try to get the same access. And that is what we are going to try to do in the next demo on a Linux machine. So what we are doing in a Linux machine could also be doable on the Windows machine with a different exploit. So what I'm going to do is, this is the Linux web server that I have that I'm going to power on. I'm going to use a Kali Linux machine to hack that device and I'm going to just power off my Windows 7 machine. Give it a minute till it boots up. Now this is also a demo machine that we have which has its own uh, pre-configured vulnerabilities. So here we've got something from the pen testers lab uh, and has a shell shock vulnerability imp implemented inside. Shell shock vulnerability uh, affects Linux, Mac and Unix based operating systems for a particular version of the bash shell. Bash is the bone again shell which is the command line interface in these operating systems. So what we are trying to do here is we are going to use the Kali Linux machine, try to find out the the vulnerability over here and if it exists we are going to use metasploit to attack this machine now the first and foremost thing is we want to identify the ip address we have no idea what the ip address is we are in the same subnet so we are assuming that we are able to connect to this machine so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open up a tool called zenmap i'm going to open up a command line interface find out what my ip address is and my ip address is this with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0 so i want to see if there are any other machines that are live in the same subnet and we are doing a ping sweep over here to identify which machines are live in a minute we'll get all the ip addresses 71.1 2 133 254 and 128 we know that we are 128 at this point in time uh 254 is the dhcp server so we are assuming that 133 is the machine that we want to look at and let's then try to see if we can scan that machine 133 and we're going to do an intense scan to find out which ports are open what services are running over there and if it is whether the pen test la machine that we were looking for you can see of the start port 22 and port 80 and somewhere here it's going to give us the ports that are open and the details about those ports and somewhere here it will tell us that this is the pen tester lab machine that we wanted which is correct so now we want to do a vulnerability analysis on this what we are going to do is i'm going to use another gui based tool called sparta which i can just find out from here sparta uses two tools in the background a nmap tool and a tool called Nikto. So we're just going to start scanning 192, 168, 71.133 was the IP address. Add to scope and over a period of time you can see all of these will start populating with information. There we are. That's the Nikto tool coming in, scanning on port 80, which is uh, which means that it's a web server using HTTP. It tells us it's an Apache HTTP httpd 2.2.21 and uh, gives us the 22 port number as well if we head over to the tab of nikto or let's look at the screenshot first this is what the website would be looking like and nikto gives us the options over here it tells us that there is a vulnerability over here for shell shock and this is the path where the vulnerability is going to exist so what we are going to do we go back to the command line sorry we open up a new one minimize all these other windows and we are going to open up metasploit Metasploit is a penetration testing tool that is used by most hackers and ethical hackers to test applications and test uh, existing exploits and vulnerabilities. So just give it a minute till it starts. You can see there are already around 1700 exploits right here. Uh, we are going to see all those exploits with these commands. There we are, sorry for the typo. And it will just give us a list of all the exploits that are stored in Metasploit in this version. So all of these are Windows based. If we scroll up, we will be looking at other vulnerabilities as well or exploits, the Unix based exploits, Linux, OS X, multi exploits. And we are looking for a exploit for um, multi based Apache or HTTP. 
let's go up uh, let's look at so this is the one that we're looking for apache mod cgi bash environmental executable so what we're going to do is we're just going to copy it go back to the bottom say use exploit and paste the one that we wanted press enter say show options so it'll ask us to configure this i'm just going to configure it based on the knowledge that we have set our host which is the remote host the victim's machine so we put in the ip address it asks us for the target uri so that's the path that we saw set target uri to cgi hyphen bin slash status enter now with the exploit we need to find a payload that is going to give us the output that we want so we say show payloads and it will give us a list of all the compatible payloads with this exploit and we want to create a reverse tcp connection which is this so we know it's a linux operating system we want this uh, payload to be set so set payload press enter that's the payload coming in show options now that we have set the payload this is the options for the exploit and now we want to set our options for the payloads as well so we are creating a reverse tcp connection which means we are remotely executing code at the victim side and we are making the victim connect back to our machine which means we need to set up a listener so i need to put my ip address over here set localhost or l host 192.168.71.128 which was our ip address show options again just to ensure everything is fine which looks like it is and we then type in the word exploit so that it will start this attack i can see that it has created a metapreter session at the victim side and it has opened up a session so if i do a pwd now pwd is a linux command for present working directory and it will show us that we'll connect it to var dub 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 cgi hyphen bin do an ls it will list all the files that's the status file over there do a cd backslash it will take us to the root of this machine now remember we saw the uh, passwords on a windows machine similarly we can head over to the cd etc folder ls and you can see these files pssd and shadow now pssd is the file where linux stores its usernames and shadow is the file where passwords are shown so do a cat command pssd and you can see these users coming up so you can see the last user pentest lab and you can see there are no passwords so let's do a cat shadow and that's your hash value for the password that we have for the user pentest lab so these are the different attacks that we need to understand uh, and we need to create based on the vulnerabilities that exist on different machines so if we just looked at windows and linux and how we can exploit them depending on existing vulnerabilities as an ethical hacker this is uh, what we need to learn in our trainings and then we need to clear our exams based on this knowledge of how these things work so that uh, we get certified and then we can position ourselves for the uh, penetration testing jobs that's it for this demo i thank you for your uh, patience with me and i'll see you in the next video Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.